So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Kieran Stevens, and on behalf of Williams Medical, I'd just like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on this webinar on World Menopause Day. This webinar is presented in partnership with Newson Health, and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Joe Sewell today. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Joe. Hello, thank you for having me, especially on World Menopause Day. <laughs> Yes, um, just before we make a start, there are a few bits of housekeeping that I'd like to run through. So in terms of time, this webinar is scheduled for one hour and then in, within that time slot, we'll have plenty of time um, of questions towards the end. In terms of questions, we'd like to invite your comments and questions throughout the session. So if you do have a question, please use the chat function, which should be at the top of your screen. This session will be recorded and will be available after the session, along with some useful resources and content from the webinar. These will be issued as part of our post event communications. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Joe to start the session. Great, thank you, Kieran. Um, yeah, as we said, I'll do the talk and then we can do any questions at the end. So obviously, with on World Menopause Day. So the conversation today is going to be about menopause and perimenopause. Um, I am a GP and menopause specialist. I've gone a long time of working in the NHS, but now do mainly um, private work, but understand what it's like in primary care and how difficult some of these things can be to achieve in a, in a short consultation. So I have to say that I have um, no other interests except that I do take HRT myself. So this brings us on to what is the menopause? Well, menopause technically is defined as 12 months since your last menstrual period. And this can either happen naturally or for some women, they go into a surgical menopause if they've had their ovaries removed or even a chemical menopause if they've been given certain injections. We know that Prior to the menopause, women can be symptomatic for up to 10 to 14 years before when their hormones are very fluctuant and going up and down. And this can be known as the perimenopause. And you can still be having periods during this time, but not really realising that this is happening to you. We know that the average age in the United Kingdom for a Caucasian woman to go through the menopause is actually 51. For some other ethnicities, um, they often go through it earlier. And so there is a range of menopause um, of about 45 to 55 years. Early menopause is defined as a menopause between the ages of 40 and 45. And then we have premature ovarian insufficiency, which sadly is more common than we probably realise. And three in 100 women will go through the menopause before the age of 40 one in a thousand before the age of 30 and one in 10,000 before the age of 20. The premature ovarian insufficiency is often associated with autoimmune conditions and for these women um, we need to be looking at whether or not they've got other conditions such as thyroid or celiac disease and also checking things for their bones such as DEXA scans as well. So what's the history of the menopause? Well Previously, we were never meant to live very long into the menopause. The age of menopause back in early 1900s was still similar, but our life expectancy was only into the late 50s. Whereas now, we tend to spend a third of our lives in the menopause, which is quite a long time if we're not feeling great. We know that we have low levels of estrogen, low levels of testosterone and progesterone, and these can give us significant symptoms and almost um, and also numerous health risks. So we really want people to have a good quality of life after the menopause. Some people say the menopause isn't a great definition because meno basically means periods, pause means stop, and it just means stopping periods. But we know that there's a lot more to it. And actually, some people are suggesting that we should be calling it a female hormone deficiency with long-term health risks. These women on the side are all women who are in the media for various reasons and are promoting um, menopause awareness. 
So what is the scale of the problem? Well, we know that 47 million women reach the menopause every year around the world, and that 79% will have visited their GP about their symptoms, of which 7% had to visit their GP more than 10 times before receiving the help that they needed. And although 25% suffer significantly severe menopause symptoms, 77% do not realise their symptoms are due to the menopause. 44% of these women who eventually received treatment had to wait for a year or more, and 12% will have had to wait more than five years, particularly if they've had to be referred into a specialist centre because there's an increased demand and not enough specialists. So what's happening to our hormones throughout our lifespan? Well, we know that there's three reproductive hormones for women, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And as you can see from this slide, our hormones increase during puberty. Oestrogen and progesterone vary much more up and down, but they stay a lot more level when we're in our reproductive years. And then as we go into the perimenopause, they mimic a reverse of puberty. Testosterone is a different one. I personally never even realised that testosterone was a hormone that women made, even when I was at medical school or in my GP training. And it was only when I actually started to do my menopause training that I realised that we had such a hormone. We naturally produce three to four times more testosterone than we do oestrogen from our ovaries. We just don't produce as much as men. We actually produce 10% um, of what men do, but it's still our dominant reproductive hormone. And as you can see from the slides, we reach our peak in our late 30s, sorry, our, early, our late 20s, early 30s. And we have a natural decline so that by the time we're 40, we're functioning at 50%. Now, men also have oestrogen and progesterone. They just have it in different ratios to us. In women, testosterone is important for um, egg, to egg production. And in men, oestrogen is important for sperm function. So what do we know about the hormones? Well, we know that there's receptors for the hormones absolutely everywhere in the body. So we've got them in our hair follicles and our scalp, so women may explain hair loss, but we've also got them in all the systems of the body. So we know that, for example, um, women may get palpitations, they may, because they're around the heart, they may start to notice they've got dry eyes because they're in the eyes, they may get um, problems with muscle and joint aches and pains because they're in the um, in the muscles and the joints. They may also notice that they're going to the toilet more frequently. They're getting more urinary tract infections because they're around the bladder. They're around the vagina, so they might start to notice they're getting um, uh, vaginal dryness. And they may also notice that um, they're starting to have other symptoms like hot flushes or night sweats. But often women complain of cognitive problems such as um, low mood, anxiety. They may also notice they've got poor concentration, memory loss, brain fog and low energy. So the hormones are everywhere. We also know that if we give oestrogen, that we need to be giving progesterone. Progesterone is a very important hormone for protecting the lining of the womb. And if we're giving oestrogen, we know that we can get thickening of the lining of the womb. And progesterone helps to prevent that. Progesterone also has lots of other, um, other properties. It has incredible properties on the brain and it has a sedative property. So it often helps with sleep, which often gets affected in women. But it also helps... Um, to have an anti-anxiety um, property. So it's very neurocalming. And again, that's a common symptom for women. So progesterone has lots of other roles as well. And then obviously we've got testosterone, which I've already mentioned. And testosterone, I always think, is, um, is a bit undersold. It's not licensed for women in the UK at all. The only country it is licensed is Australia, although we now know that it is one of our most dominant hormones. But the NICE guidelines say we can give testosterone for low libido. And I actually think that gives testosterone a bit of a disservice because we can see here that testosterone receptors play a huge role. They're located in the eyes, so again, dry eyes, re recurrent styes. We know it also works at the level of the liver to reduce cholesterol production, and it also helps to dilate the arteries and help um, reduce blood pressure. We know it helps with urinary health and incontinence. It also helps with vaginal health and vaginal dryness. It has a big role in bone density, just like oestrogen does. And we know that it helps with muscle joint aches and pains, as well as energy, and on the brain for memory and learning. So 
What are the most common symptoms of perimenopause and menopause? Well, most people associate the menopause with hot flushes and night sweats. I know that's what I can always remember people talking about when I was at medical school. And nobody ever mentions all these other symptoms. But psychological symptoms are really common. And also the menopause can throw up surprising symptoms as well. So when we look at psychological symptoms, I look back at the women I probably treated in, um, in my early days as a GP, and I probably would have given them antidepressants, whereas that's not actually what they needed. So you see the top 20 here on the right hand side, you've got things like brain fog, anxiety, low libido, memory problems, low mood and joint pain, feeling tired, difficulty with their sleeping, and then hot flushes comes along. Well, we've had a long list before that. So women, if 30% of women will never have a hot flush or a night sweat. So they might get referred to rheumatology, be given antidepressants, you know, um, but not necessarily anybody mentioning their hormones. Then we've got weight gain, headaches, bloating, low motivation, then night sweats pops in, irritability, difficulty concentrating, mood swings, feeling tense, lack of interest in things and feeling nervous. But also there's all those other things like I mentioned, dry eyes, maybe metallic taste, burning sensation, pins and needles. So there are so many other symptoms as well. What we know is that it's really important that we ask women to track their symptoms so that we can then um, deal with them appropriately in a 10 minute consultation if we're in primary care, because it's not a lot of time for us to actually um, be able to deal with it if we're saying to people we just have time for one problem. So we've talked about these psychological symptoms of the menopause, and I think it's really important that if women come to us and speak about it, that we maybe just gently look at their age, maybe look at and say to them, because they could still be having periods, but asking them, are your periods still regular? Are you um, getting heavier periods or lighter periods? And then maybe wondering if they've already been on antidepressants, are these working and do we need to think about something else? We also know that menopause leads to other health problems in women. Actually, the biggest cause of morbidity and mortality in women after the menopause is heart disease. And interestingly, we go from being much lower than men. Men may be here, we're here. We catch them up and then we go past them, which isn't really a race I personally want to be winning. So we know that Oestrogen and testosterone work at the level of the liver to reduce cholesterol. They work on the arteries to relax the arteries and reduce blood pressure. And they actually, HRT can help reduce the risk of heart disease by about 50%. We've always known that oestrogen plays an important role in osteoporosis, and we know before the breast cancer scares that HRT was first-line treatment for osteoporosis and reduces the risk by about 60%. What I never used to realise, though, was actually... When we're oestrogen deficient, we become insulin resistant. And this is often why we see a lot of women around the menopause getting diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. But also they might start to say that they haven't got the same blood sugar control that they used to have. And this is also another time to maybe discuss the menopause with these women. We often find women become more obese, and that's because when their blood sugars are not regulated, if they're not sleeping well, they're going to have um, more of the ghrelin hormone going up, which makes you feel hungry, less of the leptin, which tells us we feel full so that you're more likely to eat more than 35% more calories. If they're feeling achy and stiff, don't have motivation or energy, they're not going to be exercising in the same way as well. And we also know that sarcopenia, so muscle loss, occurs around this time. And this is where testosterone actually plays an important role because muscle helps us to metabolize fat. We know that there's cognitive decline in early dementia and two thirds of dementia patients are actually female. And we know that hormones have been shown to have an impact on reducing the risk of dementia. We know there's a big link with depression, psychosis and suicide in women around the menopause and that the risk of suicide increases around the age of 40 to about 55 in women. And this is something that we need to be aware of. And actually, the Royal College of Psychiatrists are now doing a lot more work of working alongside um, women with menopause people um, in their teens. So as you can see, it has a big impact. So I just wanted to talk through a case study of a lady that I saw. She was 46. She herself worked in the NHS. She'd been a midwife in a busy hospital. 
And um, she'd been to her GP um, with symptoms of insomnia, fatigue, anxiety, low mood, poor concentration, poor memory, loss of confidence and worsening migraines. And if you looked at that, working in a, as a midwife in a busy hospital, you could easily say, well, actually, that could just be due to the stress and anxiety at work. However, on more questioning, her mother had recently been diagnosed with dementia and Laura was feeling quite overwhelmed. So her anxiety worsened, she couldn't remember names anymore or words, her confidence had dropped and her migraines had increased, so she was now needing um, medication for them twice a week. She also had vaginal dryness and cystitis, so she was getting urinary tract infections, which she hadn't suffered with before. And there had been a change in her periods. They'd become a bit heavier. Her cycle was a bit longer. And um, sorry, her periods were a bit longer, but her cycles had shortened. She was advised that her symptoms were nothing to do with her hormones, as she was still having periods. She'd not had any hot flushes or night sweats, and her blood tests were normal. Well, we know that FSH is not a reliable blood test in the perimenopause because it's up and down. So that's why it's not always reliable. And like I said, 30% of women never get any vasomotor symptoms, but 90% will have cognitive um, psychological symptoms. She was given an antidepressant, citalopram for anxiety and low mood, diazepam for some panic attacks as they were getting so severe, but the medications weren't helping and she was signed off work with anxiety. She handed in her resignation three months later and this was a big financial cost to her family as she was the main breadwinner. Now I just want to talk to you about the Balance app. It's something that um, we have devised and it is free for women and for men and for anybody who wants to download it and the great thing about it is it allows women to track their symptoms and I would always suggest if you want to think about yes I want to prescribe antidepressants but is it their hormones you might want your patients to have a little look at this and to um to track their symptoms and see if there's a cyclical pattern or how many that they're ticking. And then it might be a great way for them to be able to talk to you about menopause. Also, it's a great time saver if you've only got 10 minutes. Um, you can get the patients to go away and book them in again to see them having done this. So unfortunately, this lady didn't have anybody talk to her about her um, hormones. So she came to see me in the clinic. Um, and she um, was started on body identical HRT. Now, body identical HRT is um, the type of HRT that we tend to use now first line. It's uh, got the same molecular structure as our own hormones. It's made from plants, it's yang based, and um, it has less side effects than the synthetic hormones, which would have been found in the oral HRT and also in oral contraceptive. Um, the oestrogen tends to come in patches or gels, so it um, is transdermal and therefore it's not being broken down in the liver. So there's absolutely no increased risk of blood clots. So it doesn't matter what your family history is, what your history is. If you've got a history of clotting, you've got a history of migraines like this patient, you can still take it safely. Um, we gave her microimmunes progesterone, which is also natural, also body identical, less side effects than synthetic progestogens, and less risks. So three months later, she felt better. Her HRT was optimized, and we actually added testosterone in. Nine months later, she actually felt much better and back to normal. Testosterone can take three to six months to fully get effect, and um, she returned to work as a midwife. 15 months after that, she actually applied for a promotion and was successful in becoming a senior ward manager. So the benefits for Laura, she'd had improved quality of life. She actually described it as transformational. Her relationship was back on track. Her relationships at work were much better. And we often find that women will say they've become more irritable, less tolerant, more snappy at work. So it's not just in their family situation, but it's outside of their family at work, where it's another place where you have quite close relationships, isn't it? And sometimes you might become more snappy than you were before. Her finances were better because she was working. She had no symptoms. She was sleeping well. Her mood was better and she had no further urine infections and her libido was better and intercourse was more comfortable. Because she had more energy, because she wasn't aching, she was able to exercise and she had the motivation to eat and drink healthily. And also her musculoskeletal symptoms had improved. So what are the benefits for the employer? Well, as a frontline worker of the NHS, she's back in employment, which is fantastic. We already have enough gaps in the NHS where we don't need people off because of the menopause. 
she'd taken promotion, which is great because we were using her skills and we were getting the most out of her. She'd also not needed sick pay anymore and the cost of re-employing highly skilled member of workforce was um, was stopped, so that's really good. Also, there's the benefits that she was no longer needing to go back to her GP for all her various individual appointments now that her symptoms were under control. She'd previously been attending 10 times a year. She was also saving the NHS costs for unnecessary investigations. We often see patients refer for palpitations to cardiology, then they're told everything's fine, but they're obviously still anxious. She wasn't needing to go to neurology for her memory or her migraines. Sometimes we get those patients where we just can't get on top of their UTIs, so they go to urology. Um, some patients, their anxiety and their mood get so severe, they become suicidal that we're referring them to psychiatry. Dizziness and tinnitus is another classic low oestrogen symptom where patients will often have been to ENT. And the sore mouth syndrome or the burning mouth, very common with low oestrogen. And again, we see many, many patients who might have been given a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and their symptoms all stop once they take HRT. Now, who takes it? Well, 75% of women say they don't know enough about HRT to make an informed choice. Um, in 2000, before the breast cancer scares, about 26% of women took HRT in the United Kingdom. In 2022, the last statistics showed that only 14% were taking in that it, and that's even after the promotion of menopause at the moment. The biggest problem is people are still frightened to take it. Okay, so we know that there's nice guidelines, international menopause guidelines and European guidelines, and all of these say that they need to be individualised care. When it comes to the women who've had an early menopause, the ones I mentioned in those initial slides, now it's completely safe for them to take hormones up to the age of 51 with no increased risk of anything, even if they're taking oral HRT or transdermal HRT. So they should be replacing their hormones up to the average age of HRT. But for the majority of women, men, the benefits of HRT outweigh any risks. OK, so because there's no increased risk of blood clots, there's now no maximum length for taking HRT. So why are so few women still taking it? And I think one of the biggest things I'd say is because we're still worried. We still label it with the same risks as the older types. Also, there was a lot of scare in the news. 2002 was when the Women's Health Initiative study came out and it said that things like HRT pill triples the risk of cancer. However, we now know that the study was not very robust. It had small numbers. It looked at a very elderly population. We know as you age, you're more at risk of cancer. So I can see this is coming up in the chat and I will come to answer these questions individually. But I know that this is always the most common thing that's asked about breast cancer and HRT. Well, we know that there's no increased risk of breast cancer in women who are young. So you can take HRT up to the age of 51. There's no increased risk at all. And that if for women who've had their womb removed um, and don't need the progesterone, that actually oestrogen is protective and it reduces the risk of breast cancer in these women by four per 1,000. OK, but what we know is that if you look at the baseline risk of women who aren't taking HRT, who are in their 50s, 23 per 1,000 women will go on to get breast cancer. OK, what that old study said was the oral synthetics increase the risk of breast cancer by a further four per 1000. OK, but interestingly, that statistic is not statistically significant. OK, so what we now know is that if you drink alcohol a few nights a week, which many women do, that actually increases your risk by five per 1000. OK, so actually there's a bigger risk from drinking alcohol than there is from taking the older type of HRT. If you have a BMI of over 30, that increases your risk by a further 24 per 1000. So actually having a raised BMI increases your risk of breast cancer a lot more, much more significantly than actually taking HRT. But what we now know is if you exercise regularly, that reduces your risk by 7 per 1,000. But the other thing that's really interesting is the new types of HRT. So the transdermal estrogen with the um, microionized progesterone, not the synthetic progestogens, actually there's no increased risk of breast cancer. So to the person who put in the thing, when you've got a high risk of breast cancer, it doesn't change that risk from your baseline. 
okay, is the older progestogens. But again, like I said initially, the risk is very low. Also, there is no clot risk anymore with the new types. This is a picture of the progesterone, the microRNAs progesterone on them. And so as long as the estrogen is going through the skin, there's no increased risk. OK. But HRT comes in different forms and it's not a one size fits all. Some people get on well with the gels, some people get on well with the patches and there's lots of different ways of taking it. Some people don't get on with progesterone at all. So we have to try vaginal roots um, or rectal roots and we need to work it so it works for each woman. So it's a bit like when women went on the pill, it didn't always work, they might have to change it. HRT is the same and women will need different doses. Some women won't need a lower dose, some women may need a higher dose and that has to be worked out according to their symptom checkers. Also, um, we know that there's benefits of HRT. It helps to improve symptoms and quality of life. And we've already touched on what it helps to reduce previously. But we know that all cause mortality is actually reduced by 30% in women who take HRT. And these are some of the quotes from patients who've had a good outcome with HRT. But um, this is this is really good, but not everybody can access all their HRT and testosterone isn't always available for everybody. Testosterone is something that you would need blood tests for because we have to monitor that you're in the female range. And um, it's it's variable between women as to um, whether or not they need testosterone, estrogen and progesterone or whether they just need estrogen and progesterone. And again, that's where it's individualized. But not everybody can have um, HRT. So what else can we do? So lifestyle changes are always really important. And we know that a diet that's mainly plant based, that's um, an emphasis on vegetables, fruits, nuts, whole grains, lean vegetable, or animal protein and fish helps to minimize um, risks. We obviously try to avoid ultra processed food and refined sugars. And not only is that going to help with your um, menopause symptoms, but it's also going to help with your general health and well-being. But obviously, there's always factors with access due to um, price, etc. And there will be populations who are vulnerable and won't necessarily be able to access a good diet as easily. Um, exercise, as we've already heard, is really good for our health. We know it helps to reduce your risk of breast cancer anyway, but it also helps with our mental well-being and our um, cardiovascular health and our bone strength. So it has got a really positive impact. We know that smoking increases your risk of hot flushes, um, night sweats. It also increases your risk of um, osteoporosis as well as heart disease. So reducing smoking will really help with that. And again, alcohol, as we age, unfortunately in women, we reduce the amount of um, alcohol dehydrogenase that helps us to break down alcohol. And therefore, we often get the effects of alcohol, even maybe after one glass of wine, where we can feel like we've been on a big night out the following day. So reducing alcohol does play a big role. And that also has a big impact on reducing those palpitations, anxiety. Um, again, it will help with night sweats and hot flushes. But what we do know from questionnaires that we've asked uh, many women is um, they often turn to alcohol because they're feeling more anxious, because they're feeling overwhelmed. So this needs to, so these conversations need to be had with patients. Vitamin D and calcium is important. We don't get enough vitamin D in this country in the winter, but I usually recommend women take it all year round for their bone health. Sleep and relaxation is also important. And supplements can also be helpful. Magnesium for sleep. We know it helps with bloating, it helps with brain health, it helps with um, bone health as well. Um, there are patients who won't necessarily... Um, uh, be able to take HRT, um, maybe if they've had a, a significant breast cancer or um, a cancer where they've been advised they can't have hormones. Some patients can, um, and it's always good to have a chat with their oncologist because people often assume that they can't. Um, and there are some actually really good um, uh, forums out there that I could direct people to, but sometimes you can be given other options such as antidepressants. They will help with hot flushes and night sweats. And oxybutynin, which actually has always been considered for overactive bladder, has been known to help to decrease hot flushes and night sweats as well in women. 
CBT is on the NICE guidelines and hypnotherapy will improve anxiety and hot flushes as well. And it often works well for insomnia in these patients. But the biggest problem is the herbs that are not regulated. We don't really know what they do. I know black cohosh people can say it makes me feel really good, but we have had cases where it affects the liver and they're not necessarily regulated. St. John's wort as well can interfere with other medications. So it's really important that if you take these things, you talk to a pharmacist about them. I never say that I know much about the natural supplements because it's its own um, discipline. And I don't want to be saying to people, yes, that's safe to have it because we don't know exactly what's in it. A lot of people get hold of the natural progesterone creams online. Um, the problem with these is there's no evidence that they give us enough progesterone to protect the um, endometrial lining. And so I don't recommend taking those because they're not regulated. And also there's a difference between bioidentical and body identical HRT. Body identical is what we've talked about. So that's the patches and the gels and microionized progesterone. And this is regulated. This is in the NICE guidelines. Bioidentical is completely different. It has to be through a private clinic, but it's not regulated and it's all different titrations and amounts. So it's not something that we recommend to all patients at all. So why should organisations take menopause seriously? Well, menopause at work is a huge problem for many women and 59% of women will have had to take time off work due to their symptoms. This is not something we want for women. 21% will never go forward for a promotion they would have otherwise considered. And many women actually ask for demotion or to go part time. 18% will often work for more than eight weeks and 12% of women will resign and never return to the workforce, which is incredibly sad. Menopause support makes economic sense. And a 2021 analysis by Newson Health estimated that the silent cost of a lack of menopause awareness and support in the workplace is costing the UK economy £10 million. And that's counting the cost of staff leaving and recruitment costs for rehiring and training replacement staff. And when it comes to individual members of staff, it's found that women could be facing a lifetime pension shortfall of £30,000 because of it due to time off due to the menopause. The financial cost of the menopause has a big impact on the NHS because we know that all of those things are made worse when women are in the menopause. And we can see that these are billions of pounds worth of cost to the NHS. And menopausal women taking HRT have a reduced risk of all of these conditions. So it's something that we need to be considering, especially as there isn't enough money in the NHS anyway. So what can organisations do? Um, for women in both the perimenopause and menopause. Well, we can change the culture and remove taboos. Having this talk today is a big thing. Um, support groups, menopause guidance, and providing menopause education for all. And that's where that balance app that I discussed is really good because it gives lots of links. It gives recipes, it gives um, exercises, there's yoga instructors, Pilates instructors, but it also gives evidence behind everything. And it's not pharma-based evidence, it's just regular regulated evidence, which is really, really good. Um, so it's, it's um, it empowers women to be able to go and make informed healthcare choices and treatment choices, and just be able to open up that discussion, which is so important. What can line managers do? Well, they can understand the impact of hormone changes, and I'm hoping that this will help people who didn't necessarily know how all the hormones worked. Um, and hopefully it advocates for your staff to help remove barriers which may prevent a colleague from thriving at work. I get many patients who say, well, I wouldn't talk to my manager, but I've been pulled up three times in the last year because I'm not working as well or I'm forgetting things. And I say, have you talked to them about how you're feeling and what's going on? You know, if you've had a bad night's sleep as well and you can't function till the middle of the day, then probably scheduling meetings first thing in the morning might not be best for you or vice versa if you've tends to flag in the afternoon then you know it's having these discussions and seeing how we can optimize for women and signposting to evidence-based resources and support available in your organization i know things like the daisy network is brilliant for women with um poi and so there's lots of support charities out there as well so find your champion and create a task force and change the culture and remove the taboos around the menopause. And one of the things is encouraging healthy lifestyle. I think it's really easy when we're busy and we're stressed. We often reach for chocolate. We reach for, you know, 
anything that's going to give us a month, but maybe promoting movement in the workplace, standing desks, exercise. And if we have vulnerable populations working, be mindful of barriers to food access, house literacy and so on. Um, and hopefully that will empower all of our, our women. So like we said, there's the Balance app. And since using the app, we find a lot of people feel they are more empowered. They've been able to um, improve their mental health and their physical health. 69% will have started HRT treatment versus 14% of the UK population. They also, even if they don't want to start HRT, they can feel more comfortable about talking about the menopause at work and maybe miss fewer days because they're able to self-care better. So the take home messages from today's talk is really that menopause is more than just hot flushes and many women don't get them. Low hormone levels cannot be replaced without taking HRT and HRT provides more benefits than risks for most women. But women should receive individualised advice. OK, and be mindful of psychosocial stresses, the impact of poor sleep, weight loss or weight management and look at diet and movement. There's also a great website, the Balanced Menopause website. It's got loads of information on there, loads of leaflets for patients or for yourself. It's also got policies you can implement in the workplace. Um, and it's got lots of information from other healthcare professionals on there. There's been cardiologists, oncologists. There's a great section on breast cancer that I always signpost women to, um, which is really helpful if they've had breast cancer. Um, and there's lots of resources on there, so hopefully um, people will find that helpful. There's the QR code for the Balance app. Um, and one thing I did want to just signpost people to is the Confidence in the Menopause Online Education Programme. It's completely accredited. It's about 21 hours of CPD. It is about £9.99 a month, I think. But there's an awful lot of resources on there. And it goes through the basics of HRT. And it's not just for healthcare professionals. You can join it. Um, and there's a version for non-healthcare professionals. But it's got a lot of excellent resources. It's got stuff on there about heart disease, about osteoporosis process, how to care for these women, um, a woman with an early diagnosis of menopause, a woman that wants to talk about testosterone, um, maybe a woman who's had a history of blood clots or migraines, women, what, what to do if a woman has a lot of bleeding on HRT, how to deal with a patient with breast cancer who wants it. So there's a lot of resources out there as well. I think I've talked for long enough, so I guess this brings us to the questions. Okay, so I can see a couple of questions in the chat already. Just a reminder, if you have a question which you haven't yet submitted, um, please enter it in the chat box now. Um, and Dr. Joe will be able to answer your questions. <laughs> OK, so I can see what came up originally was what can you take um, for a cancer patient who cannot have HRT treatment? What I always say is there's obviously the the antidepressants that we talked about, the oxybutynin, but I think it's also worth knowing what their symptoms are and what their issues are. We do know that many oncologists are now more in favour of women having breast cancer. And it's worth knowing what type of breast cancer and what stage and going to the oncologist. And that's where I would also look at um, our website for the breast cancer because we find that some women actually realize that their risk is actually quite low they want to try it or they want to try other things there's also a great resource called menopause and me by danny binnington she has a forum she has a lot of reputable um, doctors on there that can help and it's great help and support for women who've had menopause following either um, a cancer diagnosis or because of their treatment, or because they've had breast cancer in the past and they don't feel they can take hormones. But there's a lot of good resources out there for them. Um, and someone who has a high risk of breast cancer, we've got some good resources about women who maybe have tested positive for BRCA. It's um, uh, women who've had their breasts removed and their ovaries removed are often advised that they possibly can take HRT because it doesn't change their background risk. But if the, it depends what your risk is. But um, as I said, the transdermal um, body identical HRT doesn't have the same risks as the old synthetic progestogens and synthetic estrogens as well. 
And again, there is again some good resources on the Balanced Menopause website. Um, what's the next one? Very useful webinar. So I was going mad. Twenty-one years of perimenopause. Yeah, people do think they're going mad, and they're not. It's just their hormones. One year full-blown full menopause brought on by injections for breast cancer. We'll certainly be looking at the app. Yeah, please do um, have a look on there. Have a go to those um, uh, resources I've just mentioned, and hopefully find that helpful. How long do you take HRT for? Is there an age when you would stop taking it? So back when they used to use the synthetic orals, it used to be maximum of five years, definitely stop by the age of 60 because our increased risk of blood clot, our increased risk of stroke was high and this would increase it. Now with body identical, there's no increased risk at all of um, stroke or blood clot. So actually we say there is no upper age limit. And as long as you're taking it, you're still getting all those health benefits. My eldest patient's 87. She's not on any other medication. She does yoga every day. She's my inspiration. Um, I think um, Louise has got a patient who's 92 who's still taking it. And again, not on any other medication. So it's about how you feel. Um, and, you know, we usually say have an annual review with your health care provider. Discuss, you know, the benefits, the risks. Usually the benefits outweigh the risks. And so you can keep on taking it. Um, do symptoms continue in the postmenopause stage? Unfortunately, because once we're hormone deficient, we remain hormone deficient. Some women find their hot flushes may settle. It generally follows the pattern of what your mother or your sister or your aunt or whatever followed. Um, but we find that a lot of women, they still struggle with cognitive issues, anxiety. Um, they might still be getting hot flushes and night sweats. So it doesn't necessarily stop. They do need something to help replace it. Patient with Lynch syndrome had a TAH and BSO, had risk reducing surgery in 2014, starting a LEST, now age 60, how long should she take? Well, with an LEST, that's a synthetic hormone, synthetic estrogen that's oral. I would look, because she's had all of her um, ovaries removed and she's going to be, and her hysterectomy, her risk about, of breast cancer is reduced. I would swap her to transdermal estrogen. A LEST, so one milligram of a LEST is the equivalent to a 50 microgram patch or two pumps of estrogel. And I would see what she's on. Sometimes you don't absorb quite the same way through the skin. So she might have to go up. So if she was on one milligram, you might find she doesn't get all the same benefits at 50 milligram, at 50 microgram patch or two pumps of gel. So you may want to go up to 75 or three pumps or 100 or four pumps. And that's absolutely fine. And she can, like I said, she can take it for as long as she wants. And also if she's had her ovary roots removed, please, please, please think about testosterone because like we said we produce three to four times more testosterone and it tends to be a real game changer if you feel confident or if you want to learn more about prescribing it you can do the confidence in menopause course that i mentioned if not um I would refer into uh, maybe your local menopause, NHS menopause specialty, or, you know, if they've got private, they could go to a private clinic um, like ourselves. But it's, I would recommend considering testosterone in those women that have had their ovaries removed. Can you please advise how someone with history of heart attack can be managed? Well, actually, the new guidelines say that we, it is safe to give transdermal, obviously not orals. So these women can have transdermal estrogen. And actually, it's going to benefit them because it's going to be looking at their, um, reducing their cholesterol, helping to maintain their blood pressure. People have always been scared in the past that a high blood pressure means you can't take HRT. Transdermals, you can start alongside the anti-hypertensive medication and it will help to reduce their blood pressure. So don't let it be something that stops you prescribing it because it's completely safe, but it's always got to be the transdermal. And there's some great stuff on um, our website, plus there's some um, things on the BMS about um, heart attack and that, but there is some good resources out there that it's okay for these women. Can women restart HRT after stopping for a few years? Yes, absolutely. There used to be a thing that they thought that it increased your risk of cardiovascular disease if you stopped HRT um, and you've had a rebound, but actually there's a lot of evidence now saying that that isn't the case. I've had many women who maybe stopped in their 50s because they were scared and then actually they've said, oh, I feel awful. It's absolutely fine to go back on. 
Can patients who've had breast cancer in the past safely have topical vaginal HRT? Yes, absolutely. And I would recommend it. And particularly those poor women who are on aromatase inhibitors where every single bit of estrogen has been zapped out of their body. Please, please, please give um, vaginal hormones. Um, I even give vaginal pessaries alongside vaginal cream. They will be sore. They will be incredible. They will be struggling with current UTIs. And I, it's safe. It's in the guidelines, making sure that they're not using any soaps or shower gels because that will worsen it. Um, you can use um, it alongside an emollient. And um, sometimes Interosa is a better one for them. Interosa is a DHEA, which um, uh, converts into estrogen and testosterone um, and some women get on well but I would use if they're really dry and sore use the estrogen cream or blissel the gel that works really nicely and also I recommend um, actually going um, um, to maybe in vagus as well as a really nice one um, it works sometimes a bit better than vagifen or vagibux but don't even say that they just have to use it twice a day they can use it daily and it's completely safe because the absorption systemically is so minimal um, I think that's all the questions I'm not sure if there's anyone else out there that's got anything else to ask I'm not sure if I've missed anything, but hopefully that's helpful. And yeah, yeah, please just to have a look at our resources and you can always email me if you want any. You can contact us through this and that's fine. I'm happy to answer any questions. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that's all the questions. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Joe. A great and very informative session. Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, so as I said at the start of this webinar, it's been great to welcome everyone to this session. Uh, and we're looking forward to delivering more education throughout the autumn. So please keep an eye out on our webinar registration page, uh, which is on wms.co.uk. Uh, and as an attendee of this session, you'll also be notified um, of any future events. So just to bring the session to a close, um, so as one of the as one of the leading um, partners for healthcare professionals in primary care, um, we are dedicated to supporting your everyday, both from a service perspective uh, and also through added value and education, as we've been able to deliver in partnership um, with Dr. Joe today. Our offering spans across numerous medical services, along with thousands of products in our disposables, equipment uh, and pharmaceutical categories. We're very proud of our excellent rating on Trustpilot. I just want to reiterate that we're here to support you and help you save time and effort uh, in practice. So once again, thank you, Dr. Joe, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we'll be following up with some resources over the coming days. And please don't hesitate to contact us if you need any support in the meantime. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>